Hello, Matt Ryan well, and creator of Script to Screen. Welcome to our 11th season finale. We're so glad, glad to be able to have the opportunity to crack open the books and break down the screenplay of Book Smart. So please welcome to UCSB Public Theater stage screenwriter Katie Silverman. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here and, and to be able to talk to you. So thank you. Nice. Uh, this has been three years in the making. We met three yes. years ago, <laughs> and then COVID hit, and you know we couldn't do it sadly. Okay, so the book smart script has been in various stages of development going back to 2009. It yeah. was a very hot script at the time. What were your initial conversation and first meeting with Olivia Wilde regarding your angle into this story? Well, I had known about this script for a long time, since 2009 probably. I had read the original draft when it came out because I was so excited when I heard that there was a movie with two young women that was like a comedy with two teenage girls at the head, which was really rare. And I hadn't thought about it in a while. And then when I heard that Olivia was directing it at Annapurna with the producers from Gloria Sanchez, which are all people I admired so much, I was really excited. And I was also excited because so much about not just the world, but specifically I think the world for young women had changed from 2009 to 2017. Like, <laughs> felt like more maybe in those eight years than like the previous 800 combined. And <laughs> And so I was very excited to hear what Olivia wanted to make and, and why she was drawn to it. Uh, and also to just get to investigate myself, like, okay, now telling a story about young women now, what is that centered on and what do we want to say and what haven't young women seen reflected on screen for themselves? I think Emily and Sarah, who wrote the original draft and who are r such talented writers, zeroed in on the kind of idea that still feels relevant 10 years later, which is like two best friends at the cusp of things really changing. And I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to come up with a core idea that still feels applicable when the world around is changing so much. Um, and I, when I first spoke with Olivia, was excited because I love high school movies and I feel like I've seen almost all of them. And <laughs> I, felt like high school movies are similar to high school and that it feels really easy to diagnose every kind of person in the movie immediately based on knowing one or two things about them. And I, was, I wanted to tell a story that reflected more of my high school experience, which was that I considered myself really smart and that was my thing and I didn't do fun stuff because that was for later. And then when I got to college, all the smartest people I knew were really fun. <laughs> and I realized that if I had known them in high school, I would have assumed they were cool kids. And then they showed up and were way smarter than me. So I was like, I kind of did that wrong. And I, I was excited for the opportunity to show, to make a movie where the whole point was to establish a high school the way we think we've seen them in movies. And then over the course of the story, pull back to reveal that everybody is so much more than what Molly and we, the audience, first thought when we saw them. Yeah, so it's, a, um, so it's very Gen Z, you know, the generation today. How did you get in that mindset to kind of show well, them back? Well, I'm very here? young, and <laughs> 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 I think we were lucky with the cast that we put together eventually. Mm. I mean, it, it, from the writing stage, I think we were lucky in a lot of ways. A, kind of YouTube as a whole, social media as a whole for all of its horrific uh, tendencies and side effects made it so that a lot of young people were putting themselves out there just first person. Like mm -hmm. you can go on YouTube and see the way people talk mm -hmm. to the camera, to each other on their video. Like there's just so much content of what young people sound like right now. And that was very helpful in terms of dialogue. I also think they, like we were writing this at the time when all of the high schoolers from Parkland were putting on the March for Our Lives. Like there were so, and Greta was doing all her protests. Like there was so much youth in the world, like speaking directly to us. And I think mm. we got to witness a lot of that. And then I think, so part of it is just like with any kind of dialogue, listening as much as you can to the way that those people actually speak, whether it's like geographic or generational or anything like that. And then I think at the core also, we wanted it to be something that felt really relevant to everybody. So we wanted it to sound specifically like the the age of the people that we were talking about, but we wanted people our age looking back and remembering their high school, or even like our parents looking back and remembering their high school time to feel like it applied to them as well. That's funny, because one of my students, Aileen, who you met backstage, made the point, like she loved the scene in the library where 
you know, they're using social media to find it out, but also for the old school way of looking at the card catalog to appeal to different yeah. audiences. <laughs> when we first wrote that scene, Olivia and I were really excited about microfiche because we yeah. love all the president's men. And then the cast was like, no, <laughs> you can't, <laughs> absolutely not. And then they were a real, an unbelievable asset in once we had a script that we were really proud of and, and happy with, there were occasional times where Olivia made it very clear from the beginning, like this is a collaboration and if there's something that you think doesn't feel quite right or you want to discuss with us, bring anything up anytime. And there were a few times where they were like, this is a little old fashioned. Mm. And, and so we got to change the language or just change small moments that way. And so it was a kind of consistent learning curve for us too, to try and make sure that it felt authentic. Now, Molly and Amy are the central relationship, obviously in the film, they're both fiercely loyal to each other, best friends, driven. More, always more controlling. Amy is a little hanging back, waiting, longing for independence. How did you develop their intertwined relationship, but at the same time giving them their own inter, you know, their own personal journey? Yeah, it was it was a very fun challenge because we knew that the point was we wanted the number one point to be that they loved each other, and they and that wasn't we knew there it was going to be structured kind of like a romantic comedy, so there was going to be a breakup of sorts at the second act break, but we also knew that the, the biggest headline in the North Star had to be how much they cared about each other and how much they loved each other, but also that it was really codependent. And we talked a lot about kind of first best friendships, except especially high school best friendships and how they, they're the most important relationship in your life and, and they can be kind of unhealthy in that way sometimes because they're, you're so devoted to them and you really have grown together. One thing we talked about is how often when you meet someone's high school best friends, they all sound exactly the same. Like they have the same rhythm and vernacular and you realize it's because they developed that together as a group. Mm. And so we wanted to give them each their own individual arc. And we knew that that arc was about creating some sort of healthy distance from the other one. So if Amy's was about gearing up the courage to stand up for herself and Molly's was about realizing she can't have like a white knuckle grip on everything she has to let go and that's part of how she loves Amy. It was, we kind of designed those arcs for themselves individually while knowing that they needed to kind of like go like this hmm. and, and end up still close, but that all of those moments of change were going to involve the other one, which ended up being like kind of a puzzle, but a really fun one to try. And sort of like a marriage. Yeah. Yeah, like approaching because they, they, they really one character, yeah. but different. Well, that's, yeah. we talked about the arc as three separate characters. It's funny you say that, because it would be like Molly's arc and Amy's arc and their friendship's arc. Mm. And we had to make it so that all the turns happened at the same time. And, and sometimes we were lucky enough where there was a way to do that in the same scene, like the scene on the lawn mm. where Molly's admitting something and Amy's standing up for herself and they as a friendship group take this shift at the same time and other times we had to just kind of line them up as closely as we could so that they were moving along at the same pace. Oh, so we'll talk a little about casting before we get into some of those individual scenes. What did you think Beanie Felstein and Caitlin Dever brought to your scripted characters that oh was my so God. special? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> they are so talented and so funny and so generous and so collaborative and I, it's really hard for me to separate the characters from them because it was also really lucky as a process, Beanie and Caitlin and Olivia and I got to rehearse so much together mm. and read through so much and, and so much of the story as it ended up being came from those moments and also just things from their own lives. Like Caitlin plays the harpsichord. And when we learned that, we were like, well, that's in. <laughs> we'll find somewhere for that. And, and the way that they speak to each other, they were so invested in the movie and each other that they, and they've spoken about this before, but they lived together all through prep and all through production, mm -hmm. even though they didn't have to because they wanted to spend that much time together and they loved each other too and they still love each other. And so one thing that was easy about that was that they really did have a, a best friendship and so we could build off of that. But I think they bring so much empathy to, mm -hmm. the, to their own characters and to each other. And, and they were so devoted in how open-hearted they were with one another that that was a huge, a, a huge gift to the writing process because you were writing from a place of really believing that they were best friends. And they also comedically are just the funniest people on earth and funny in such different ways. Like they have such different rhythms and they have such different timings and they really are fantastic there was some improv, but I mean almost improvisers in that like they they went into every scene trying to make the other one 
the funniest they could be as opposed to trying to just score themselves, which may elevated everything so much. I did like their different dances in the, their first scene together. Yeah. <laughs> Showing the different characters. <laughs> you can show how different they are. And the whole cast, Allison Jones was our casting director who yeah. is responsible for any comedy you've ever liked, really. <laughs> and she is such a storyteller herself and so creative. And in the writing process, she was auditioning everybody and, and she, she is so good at just seeing anyone she thinks is interesting. And there were a few people where there wasn't really a character written for this person, but when Allison met them, she called Olivia and I, and she was like, you have to see this person and you have to find a role for them because they're brilliant. And a few people were cast that way. Oh, oh Which was, and because she sees a whole story and she sees kind of a world so completely that she was, she was so, she's an invaluable part of the process. Sounds like, uh, just for some of our screenwriting students, this is not always the most common pro process no. where the writer, <laughs> director, and cast get actually work together. No, I <laughs> felt really, really lucky. I think, and I've been a part of projects where you write something and then you're like, see you in a year and a half, have fun yeah. with it. But this was, you know, we were rewriting as, as all of these steps were being taken. So we had a script that we really loved and we were really proud of. And then it was just an incredibly collaborative process going forward. Once people were cast, we would meet with them and, and I would rewrite the script towards those specific people once they saw locations. I did something I'd never done on this movie before, which is that Olivia would bring me to the tech scouts to oh. see the physical locations because it wow. is such a chemical equation of the actual space you're, you're in. And I've been, I've worked on movies before where the whole scene is designed around someone turning a corner to see a surprise and then there's no corner in the room and you're on the day you're like, this is a problem. Um, <laughs> and so it, it was really important to her, I think, to, to make sure that every aspect of the process from cast to locations to costumes was reflected in the script. So you weren't fighting any of that. It was all helping each other. And so it was, it was really unusual and, and so much fun and so beneficial. It's really hard to imagine doing it another way now. All right, so we're setting up the movie. Now uh, we have the opening scene where Molly listens to the recording, how she is driven and better than all those effing losers. Uh, they get to school, they're kind of invisible to the other students. Even the principal's tired of them, please go away. Uh, how did you want to set, use this opening and set up their relationship with each other, but also to the rest of the school? Yeah, it was so wonderful to have this opening coda almost of like them before their world is blown up because you got to see them at or Molly, at least at home, like we were excited to be able to show how different people are at home, alone, with their best friend who they love, and then in a situation like school, like a public situation like that. So, you know, you get to see how tough Molly is at home and how kind of all business, no mercy, that's what the energy she's bringing out into the world. But then a real benefit of showing two best friends is you see people being warm and funny and goofy with their best friends in a way that they're not with anybody else. So you get to see who they really are with each other and then you see the armor go back up when they walk into school. And, and for Molly it's armor and for Amy it's probably like shrinking and self-consciousness, she's going back into her shell a little bit, but knowing who they are when they're their best selves, which is like who they are with their best friend, and then seeing how that changes in school mm -hmm. is kind of like a, like a secret hint as to like, okay, they need to figure out how to be these people everywhere, and the journey that they're gonna go on over the course of this night is hopefully gonna help them get there. And one of the key scenes is you have the, the high school classroom scene, the classic. You have the cool teacher, Gigi, the magical creature that appears to teleport everywhere <laughs> later in the film. Shakespeare in the parking lot duo, which was one of my favorites. Jared, so many more. What goes into writing a scene like this? Because you have to introduce so many different characters in an ensemble piece, and you really only have like a minute or two. Yeah, that was probably one of the hardest scenes to write just because the logistics of it were so insane, as you're saying mm -hmm. it, and you want to be able to give every character a worthy introduction, and it's hard when everyone's, it feels like everyone's getting like 10 seconds in a scene. How do you make them all memorable? So later you're like, wait, who is that guy? Or is that the, and I think again, like one huge benefit is the cast that we had mm -hmm. because you could see them for five seconds and they're so memorable and you know exactly who they are. But it was also trying to capture how fast it feels like life moves in high school in those classroom scenarios where it's like just a fishbowl of all the people that you know and they're kind of like swirling around all the time. So it was, it was like, the kind of scene where for me I approach it as like, here's all the information we need to get out and here's what I would do if there was no time limit or problem and it could be eight minutes long. And then when you see kind of what you would do, then you're like, okay, what do I actually need? And you can whittle it down into what it is and see how many of those moments you can make 
killing two birds with one stone where two characters talking to each other gives you the reveal and then you're saving time that way and just kind of like whittling it down over and over and over. Uh, it's actually something my students really respond to is that the movie has a gay protagonist, Amy, but the conflict isn't, which I find typical in movies, focused on her coming out or being gay. Instead, the focus is the teenage dating awkwardness that everyone experiences, whether it doesn't matter their sexuality, such as when she tries to talk to Ryan that first scene. How did you approach the story of Amy to try to give it a little more realistic, you know, betrayal? Yeah, of that? we were so excited to be able to tell a story. Like we always talked about it as like this is what happens after a coming out story. It's like mm. then you're just living your life and with your best friend and very supportive parents. Who that's you know it's it's a it's a universal trauma trying to talk to your crush and it not working as opposed to feeling like a specific point of view. Yeah. And that I think was always the goal. Like we talked about how there's never, you never see someone, a character description being like, Amy, 18, straight. <laughs> like it's just whatever the default is assumed. And, and we wanted to approach everything that we did with Amy from that perspective, which is like, it, like all the characters, it's another element of her personality. It was also important to us, there are a lot of gay characters in this movie. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easy when there's only one of a certain kind of character in a story to make that their personality. And we didn't want to do that with anybody's, mm -hmm. any, any qualities of anybody. There are, there are multiple versions of a lot of, I think, descriptors that people would get. There's more than one smart girl and you see how different they are. And there's more than one LGBTQ character and there's more than one theater kid and there's more than one cool kid. Like that was kind of a central part of what we really wanted to do, which was to show like the traditional descriptors that you might get in a movie actually have nothing to do with the character that you're writing. And I did like that's the thing. Like we all can relate to being uncomfortable. Yeah. When I was 16 years old dating somebody, we're hoping that they're attracted to us. Yeah. So it does reach to me, everybody. We felt that. Yes, moment. and those nerves and yeah. and the and the fear and not putting yourself out there. Like that's we wanted as as many of these experiences as possible to feel as universal, and not just to people this age, but to people remembering but, like yeah. how they embarrass themselves. <laughs> Which I did a lot. <laughs> that, was a, that was a great scene. Uh, all right, let's come to the main inciting incident, uh, the bathroom scene. Uh, the pivotal moment comes when Molly realizes the other girls are partying and going to good schools. How do you flesh out this scene to kind of expose Molly's disillusionment, but also subvert the audience's expectation what a typical high schooler is? Kind of break a lot of norms of that Yeah, moment. this scene was kind of like what I pitched to Olivia when, when we first mm -hmm. met as to what I thought the fulcrum of the movie could be. And... We always described it as like Molly thinks that this is the end of the movie. Like Molly thinks that this is the speech that she's giving and then she'll like drop the napkin and walk out and credits will roll. <laughs> and it's so, the rug being pulled out from under her is so significant that she can't really comprehend what she's hearing for a long time because it's such like an earth shattering piece of information. And so it, it was fun to structure it that way as like she thinks like bam, like see you in, see you at the re reunion essentially. <laughs> and then it's the first step where we realize, oh, everything that we thought, because we've kind of been aligned with Molly in terms of the story so far, is about to get upended. And then when she goes out into the hallway and she realizes it's everyone, like it's it's a little, we, you know, Olivia was like filming a panic attack in real time, basically. <laughs> and, but also doing it at the moment that is the moment of celebration and, and the kind of like release for everybody else and being able to do that at the same time was really fun. Yeah. I love Olivia Wilde's uh, Hitchcock push-in shot. Yeah. On oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh... All right. So the picnic, picnic table scene is really wonderful, but I'm feeling it must have been a little difficult, too, to write. It was yeah. complicated yeah. in a good way, but, like, there was a lot to... Sometimes you're writing and you're like, oh, this is the trailer. Like, this is all the information mm. in one scene. This is the line that people are going to have to give them to know what the movie's about. And it was, it was like, we have to go to a party tonight. We knew it was going to be the turn of like, okay, this is what the movie is about. And so it was, it, it was, again, it's like with these two, there was a certain comfort, even when we were shooting it, where we knew it was going to be really funny. And, but it's another demonstration of kind of the different places where they are, where Amy would be totally fine just going home. Right. She's like, good for them. <laughs> That's great. And it's not a problem for her. And this idea that she, that Molly's going to bring her on this adventure, which at its core is kind of what Amy needs. She need, she does need to stand up for herself to do scarier things, to push herself. But it really, more than the plot is establishing their dynamic and what they need to change, which is that Molly is always pushing her and, and not giving Amy the space to do things for herself. 
But she did play the harpsichord. But she does play the harpsichord. <laughs> and that scene, that's, we shot that in Burbank, Los Angeles, and they chose that location because it's this beautiful overlook of downtown Los Angeles. And we went and rehearsed it, and we did it at Golden Hour, and it was so, it was like a Terrence Malick movie. It was so beautiful. And then we showed up to shoot, and it was completely overcast and gray. <laughs> and But it ended up working really well because that's Molly's mindset. Like, she's so yeah. miserable. It's like the actual Eeyore cloud over her. But it was <laughs> an interesting example of just, like, how good Olivia is in terms of thinking on her feet and changing maybe an intention given what you have in front of you. And then it, I think it just made the scene better. We did like the following sequence, which is the great aggressive compliment off yes. where they're fighting. <laughs> that was cute. But also they're comfortable enough to talk about Amy's, you know, masturbating partner, the stuffed animal panda, the setup for the secrets too. Mm -hmm. uh, how was that approach? Because that was, there was a lot, you were setting up a lot of things in that scene and juggling a lot of. I think in there. that, uh, the the uh, panda was originated in Susanna Fogel's draft, who's oh. the, the second writer on this, who's also incredibly talented. And it was something that we got to play with a little bit in the rewrite. I, one of my favorite things to do is to hide hints in what mm. feel like jokes or joke set pieces. And so that felt like a perfect example of like, we, are, we want on second or third or a hundredth viewing to realize that this is a moment when Amy could tell Molly the truth because Molly's saying you don't mm -hmm. have any secrets from me but she's not brave enough to yet and it's like the course of the story that's going to make Amy brave enough to finally say that um, and so we th this scene had a lot of purposes one was to just as much as possible show the intimacy that they have with one another I mean the number one purpose was to be funny but we wanted to show the intimacy and it's everything from the compliment off to the fact that Amy, Molly is a drawer at Amy's house, to the way that they engage with each other while they're getting dressed, to the comfort discussing everything about their lives. Like, we wanted it to seem like, okay, this would be every Friday of, for them, of all of high school, which is, again, why it's so insane for Molly to consider this ending and this being different in that way. And then we wanted to set up their goals, what it seems like their goal is. And, and over the course of it, you realize that they have different goals. They both have different goals, and then they'll kind of get there in their own ways. I kind of like Jared. He's I one of the Jared. funnest characters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the t-shirt I thought was great. Uh, but also, now you have the scene in the car where you got great things going. Molly and Amy speaking Mandarin. Uh, they think they ingested drugs. Uh, what would you thought about creating this comic dynamic? Because you're, you're confined in a car, which is confining, but giving Jared also hints that there's something deeper going on there, too. Yeah. I think that this was supposed to be, the hope, we were hoping with this to say, okay, these are two girls who are really inexperienced in going out and they are finally gonna like take this step and do the thing that they've been kind of scared of for the last four years. And then it's the worst thing that could possibly happen to them is to, they've broken the law immediately. Like all their fears <laughs> have come true and they're gonna go to jail and they're not gonna be able to graduate and, and, all, and how they would react to that. A big thing that we talked about all the time is like, the, if they're smart girls, they're going to react to everything the way intelligent people do. Mm -hmm. And that's, they have no street smarts. So, like, like, coming up with a plan in Mandarin to get out of the legal <laughs> ramifications of what they think has happened to them, like, they have no ability to react to it like a normal person. And so, it was fun for us to show immediately how bad they are at this, and then slowly they get better over the course of the night, to the point where when they're showing up in the library or at the party, like they're more comfortable with themselves. And that Jared is the perfect person for that to happen with because he is so desperate to be liked and eager to be part of it that he will put up with anything. He's yeah. not anyone, he wouldn't comment on any, he, anything that happens, he's like, I love it. So he was a very good foil for them in that moment. I like the boat scene because it's tragic. I mean, <laughs> it's so sad with Jared. Oh, no one's there. He's going <laughs> so out of his way. Giving me an iPad, I would go to that. Nice <laughs> uh, but you also separate Molly and Amy almost the first time mm -hmm. where you, the, oh, Gigi's greatest line, I think I've written ghost spirits in her eggs when we need, <laughs> wanting Amy to be born. Um, that was, the scene was weird and wacky, but you also now have to set up the first scene of the adventure. How much did you want to push and pull the comedy in that one? Because you know you have to escalate the comedy throughout the whole entire movie. Yes, it was, we knew that there were going to be these big, set pieces for lack of a better world word where we were going to need to hammer home the comedy and take advantage of it as much as possible but we also knew as you were saying that each one of these adventures was going to have to move their arc forward in some way and so splitting them up both for it to be like okay they're on this adventure they're not going to be able to hold hands the whole time anymore but that they were both going to be able to change more alone for the first time than they would have together. Like, if Molly was with Amy, I don't think she would have spoken to Jared that way. And if Amy was with right. Molly, I don't think she would have had that kind of adventure up there. And so we wanted to show how the kind of the leaps they can take when they're on their own. And then also to just give them, because 
Jared, Skylar Gisando, who plays Jared, and Billy Lord, who plays Gigi, are such like comedic masters on their own. We wanted to give those characters more of an opportunity to show who they are, which is easier kind of when they're dealing with one of them as opposed to dealing with both of them. Now, then we can jump to the next car scene with the principal, yes. which is a different dynamic, obviously, a principal, you know, older figure. Uh, how did you want to protect because the car scenes, like I said, can be confining, but you want to make it a little different than the other ones that feel fresh. Yes. What was that? We scene? knew when it was going to be kind of this like uh, one night adventure all across the city movie that in LA cars were going to be a big part of that. Mm. But we also knew that we were excited to take advantage of the fact that if you don't have a license and if you don't have a car, LA is a really difficult place mm -hmm. to go on an adventure because it's hard to get around. And so that each time they were going to need a different kind of knight in shining armor to show up to, to ferry them towards their next adventure. And so we wanted each of those to be their own comedic set piece. Mm -hmm. And we knew that there was going to have to be, it's kind of a fun challenge when you know, like we can't cut this because <laughs> right. otherwise everyone would be like, how did they get there? So it had to be comedically worthwhile enough that it would end up, it would stay in the movie essentially. And so we wanted to use this opportunity to show it's not just the students that Amy and Molly have been judging. And also it's not just the students that when you see one side of someone, like you only see the school side of a principal, he also has a whole life he's living and he's writing books and he's and he's taking people around in lifts and he's the party DJ. So it's it was like an opportunity we felt to take it up to the next level where the whole night was going to be about seeing kind of like the other side of the two dimensional person that they'd been judging. And, it, and we didn't want to keep it just students. We wanted yeah. to show that it was everyone that they had in that environment. OK, so then where did the most awkward sounding porn scene <laughs> audio come from? It. Horrifically, like from the internet, <laughs> I was in charge of finding that, which was really not my finest moment. But it was, it was, and it was playing it, like in the scene, like they're really reacting to it, which is not something I think you can fake. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, I'll never share the horrible places I went to discover that. <laughs> but, it, but the fact that we don't see it makes it better, actually. Yes, I think that, in some ways. Like, we knew, someone once was like, you have to see it. And we were like, no, it'll always be funnier if people have to imagine what they're hearing as opposed and to And the awkwardness themselves. between the principal with the two girls listening yeah. to that together is perfect. We just the also, we were like, we want it to be released in theaters. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so then Molly and Emmy end up at the, the murder mystery party where we see George and Alan playing eccentric characters. How fun was the craft for dinner party scene then, including writing each of your characters with an additional murder. Oh, uh, it was so <laughs> fun. I made a whole murder mystery party with all those characters that no one really cared about but me. <laughs> but um, it was so, I mean, Noah Galvin, who plays George, and Austin Crude, who plays Alan, are two of the funniest people I've ever met. And they immediately established a dynamic between George and Alan that like you couldn't have written, if you had 100 pages, you couldn't have written so well as they did. And so it was wonderful to play off of that. And also, again, to put Molly and Amy in a situation that's so outside their comfort zone. But by this point, Amy's kind of into it. Like Amy mm. would stay and do this party because yeah. it's fun and Molly's on such a horse blinders mission. And so it was, again, like hopefully a, a comedic set piece that was an opportunity to subtly show the different ways that they're changing and then give, just make it like a shooting barrel for these comedians that we were working with to, to show off how funny they are. Now, I don't have an in-depth question for this one. I'm just going to say it. Okay, what about the animated Barbie sequence? Oh my gosh, that is like straight from Olivia Wilde's brain. When I met with her to talk about the script, she was like, I don't necessarily know where it goes, but I know that I want them to have, I want them to do like a Barbie trip. I want them to trip and see themselves as Barbies. And I was like, amazing. That's a wonderful directive to be given. And so we found, we tried a few different places and we found the right place when the, find, the drugs that they've ingested finally hit them at this party. And it was just, it was really fun when I first was speaking to her about this because she had such a clear vision of not just what she wanted the movie to feel like emotionally, but what she wanted the movie to feel like cinematically like she said when we first met she was like I don't think there's any reason to make a movie unless it can only be a movie because there are so many mediums to tell stories and if you're not taking advantage of what you can do in this medium why do this expensive difficult thing and and it was an, the most amazing inspiration in terms of creating this story because we wanted to just do everything as much as we could and I think a lot of people including you know, some people that we were working with were like, you don't need this. <laughs> like of all the things to cut, this seems like the easiest thing to cut. And she was so 
passionate and adamant about what it brings to this kind of story and, and not limiting kind of girl stories and teenage stories yeah. and high school stories to what you're used to, which is like a row full of lockers and a basement party, which is what so many of them are. And so many great ones are, but it was just a wonderful North Star and reminder of how singular she wanted this movie to be and, and that everything had to match that in terms of everything else we were doing. We also, it was, we made it with this amazing group called Shadow Machine, which does uh, a lot of kind of stop motion animation and it takes a while. And so they don't shoot it until you're positive what the dialogue's gonna be. Mm. And so we couldn't, we didn't wanna ask Beanie and Caitlin to record 10 different versions of the dialogue for the animatronics. And so Olivia and I just had to record it until it was them. And that was really fun. <laughs> Well, I thought, it, but also, you know, you're talking a lot about subverting expectations. I, I, I thought it was a great moment where Amy started liking her yes. part. Even go go see their feminist ideals. I thought that was actually very interesting character-wise, too. Yes, we were we were very excited about the idea that like this. What is their worst nightmare in a drug trip? And it's to be symbols of the patriarchy. And then their actual <laughs> worst nightmare is that they're like, and we like it. <laughs> we want to stay here, actually. <laughs> But now, I mean, because it's a great comedy bit, and it was a great scene, the dinner scene, but now we're getting a little more dramatic with the post-drug scene where Gigi, the teenage oracle, um, <laughs> exposes uh, Molly's secret crush, calls her out on it. So how did you want to, what was the challenge writing this scene? Because now you got to begin to break Molly's wall down a little. Yeah. Yeah. This is what we all, I mean, I think structure should be used as much as it helps you, and I think really sticking to what you think the page structure is sometimes is a hindrance, but this is always the scene that we saw as the midpoint in that there, there was a bigger reveal as to what was actually going on and their goals shifted slightly. So like the whole movie so far has been Molly saying, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And Amy saying, I don't really want to do this. I want to go home and only doing it because Molly has asked her to and then called Malala and then kind of begged her to and they've been stuck. And this is the moment when Amy realizes there's this deeper reason that Amy wants to go, or that Molly wants to go. And so now Amy's the one saying, okay, we're going. Now Amy's pushing the action mm. as Molly's like, I'm going to go home. This isn't going to work. This is stupid. And that flip has happened. And Amy is the one encouraging her to go and saying, we're not going to give up we're gonna go and we're gonna figure this out for you. So it's like structure, plot-wise, the midpoint in terms of things shifting as to what they're looking for, but also arc-wise, the midpoint in that Molly's admitting that she's not as tough as she wants everyone to think that she is mm. to Amy. And Amy is for the first time kind of stepping up and taking charge and, and saying, okay, this is what we're doing, instead of always just agreeing with what Molly well, was Molly, doing. theoretically, felt like Molly felt like she had to be in charge. That's yeah. The little, that's what the codependent relationship. Totally. Where on that. Okay, so I'm thinking I should grow my hair out to match Molly and Amy's mask when they threaten the pizza <laughs> driver. It would come in handy. Um, this scene takes kind of a dark turn when he le dark turn when he lectures them on safety for women. <laughs> How did you want to balance this? Because you're doing really serious stuff here, but it's really funny. <laughs> it was just so fun to do <laughs> that I think, again, it was like in terms of being book smart and having no street smarts, we knew we wanted to subvert this kind of thing, which is mm. that the they think they're so tough and, and they're the danger. And then he just points out all the ways that if it wasn't a nice person like him, they would die. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, I think, we were really excited to subvert how we thought someone would react to that, which is more just horror that these young women are putting themselves in this position of danger and also slowly watching their bravado deflate as they mm. realize all the mistakes that they've made. <laughs> and Mike O'Brien, who plays the pizza delivery guy slash Valley Strangler <laughs> is also just like one of the funniest people on the planet. And he, he improvised a lot of stuff in that car and was so good at playing that kind of specific, not quite deadpan, but just disbelief at their own idiocy, which was, I think the energy you need when they're trying to play such, such crazy tough, uh, criminals. Well, it's also kind of fun because he actually describes how he does it yes, in real exactly. life. Another but he's protective hint. of the girls in the yeah. situation. I thought that was really kind of cool. We also good. laughed so hard. And, and it, the pizza delivery guy being the Valley Strangler was an idea that Olivia had when we were at the, when she was looking at jails and <laughs> was so funny that then we just worked backwards from there because we really like the idea too that he's like, this isn't how I like to kill people. I want to stalk somebody. Like I want the, I want the chase. I'm not going to just do two girls sitting in the back of my car. <laughs> 
Like, <laughs> and so he had a whole arc that we didn't want to dive into, but we felt pretty good about. <laughs> <laughs> now, they finally achieved the dream. They, they actually accomplished it. Molly has a romantic scene in the rain, se uh, rain sequence with Nick, but Nick actually confesses, you know, looks at her and confesses he's a Harry Potter head, which is a dream. Amy loves being with uh, Ryan and nails a karaoke scene. How idealistic do you want to make this moment just before you pull the carpet out from under them? We wanted to make it as idealistic as possible, I think. And, and there is a real idealism in that their whole lives, they've assumed that if they walked into a party like this, they would be jeered and booed mm. and kicked out. And the true idealism is they walk in and everybody's happy to see them. Like right. everyone, no one dislikes them. No one, everyone's assumed that they disliked them because they never would show up at the party. So that foundational realization was true. And we wanted to make sure that that was very felt. And then we also wanted both Nick and Ryan to not be bad guys in any capacity. Like, yes, they're maybe being flirtatious mm -hmm. in ways that you could argue are disingenuous, but they're not really doing anything wrong other than getting their hopes up. And they probably aren't even realizing that they're getting their hopes up. So we wanted it to really feel for both of them like they were moments away from all of their dreams coming true and then pull the rug in a way that wasn't necessarily cruelty as much as it was just like a miscommunication. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, the, 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 when she dives into the pool, I mean, uh, Caitlin Dever's acting, facially yeah. acting underwater was amazing. The idyllic way it was shot. How did this, and then obviously it flips the second she sees what's really going on. How did this pivotal scene work from writing and actually developing on set? Because it was such a critical moment. This is one that really is like all due to Olivia because oh. I, <laughs> on the page it was like, she dives underwater, she sees some legs. Oh no, <laughs> and, and it was maybe hopefully better written than that, but it was about that length. Like it wasn't, it, it, and it was Olivia's idea to turn it into this journey where underwater you see Amy kind of like becoming herself in a way, which, which she gets from the confidence and that she feels from how well things have been going with Ryan and with this karaoke moment and really coming into her own in a way that she needed and she needed to do on her own. and. It's heartbreaking when her face falls because she sees them, but it was really important to Olivia to demonstrate how beautiful that moment is of her really feeling joy underwater. And Caitlin is such an unbelievable actress mm -hmm. and to be able to do that underwater is so insane that it was, it was, it was a lesson to me as a writer in, in seeing where those moments can demonstrate the arc you want someone to be on and the change you want someone to go through better than like a written scene you think you could mm -hmm. do that this she was able to take that moment that i hadn't really given much value on the page and turn it into i think the be one of the most beautiful parts of the entire movie now this of course leads to the very raw and emotional fight between the two of them uh i like the one take thing where yeah. it was like one take but and you also cut the dialogue because mm -hmm. we you know what they're feeling what was that working that with the actors because that is the moment where yeah. everything shatters it's in, it's insane that that's one take. They're both mm. such amazing. Like the the ability to do that is so rare because you need the actors to hit everything. It's also all the way down the hallway. It's like Jason McCormick, our DP, and and everybody who put that together and worked on it. It was a really fun. I mean, it wasn't a fun scene to shoot. <laughs> it was very sad <laughs> for everyone. But it was amazing to watch everybody working together to to make that happen and and everyone else working so hard to give Beanie and Caitlin the ability to do what they were doing. And I think Olivia had the really wonderful idea that, you know, at a certain point when you're in a fight with someone you love this much, you're not really hearing anything. Like there's a thing you say that hits you emotionally and everything after that is kind of just like a sound ringing in your ear. And also that we wanted this to feel applicable to all sorts of best friends fight. Obviously the specifics of this are to what we've seen Molly and Amy go through, but that feeling of like, oh, they've accidentally gone too far and said the thing they shouldn't have said. And so at that point, it's just two people screaming and everyone knows what that feels like. It, it felt like the dialogue at the end wasn't as necessary as the audience registering what that feeling was. Especially it felt like their first fight. Yeah. Like this is their first real I think fight. too, yeah. like, and when people haven't fought for many years, this is the first, it's yeah. all the fights they didn't up. have that yeah, built up to then be this one. Now, of course, this leads to the Amy making a move on Hope scene. How did you want to approach trying to make their clumsy sex scene together as true as the character as possible, but also the situation, make it more real? I think that's, a. I mean, again, a real testament to Caitlin and Diana Silvers who played Hope and Olivia who shot that scene and developed it so carefully and respectfully and generously. And I think 
the, the nerves and joy of kind of the first time you're with someone that you really like was the most important part of it, I think. And, and the, how awkward it can be, but also the sweetness in that awkwardness if you're w with someone that you are that comfortable with and you feel good about. And I think we wanted it to, the fact that it's happening at all is like a victory for Amy, and then for it to go as badly as it does <laughs> is, is very heartbreaking. But that, I just think that scene is so like loving and so mm. sweet and, and such a wonderful thing to see like two young people treating each other that way. And, it, and you know, it's a very, um, they're very respectful of each other without making like consent with a capital C part of the, the scene itself. And I think all of that was done so elegantly because of that direction. Now you made a different choice. Uh, Molly's post fight is with Annabelle in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, what was, uh, when you also arrived, what was the choice to make, you know, Molly go with Annabelle? Well, yeah, I fight. truly was like, who? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Annabelle or AAA Triple A is, um, she, I, that was my favorite scene to write, I think, mm. because AAA, I think, is a, the kind of character that we see in high school movies a lot who never gets to explain her side of the story and is never given anything other than what everybody else says about her. And so we wanted Molly, before Molly goes to apologize to Amy, we wanted Molly to be forced to be with the person that she has judged the most. Mm. If her journey has been about, okay, I've judged a lot of people too early and too harshly, and this is the person that she's judged the most. And we wanted to give Molly Gordon, another unbelievably talented actress, and, and who was very collaborative in, in figuring out specifically how this would scene, scene would feel and hear sound bleh, with Beanie. <laughs> um, we wanted to give her the opportunity to really defend herself. And for a second, it feels like it's Triple A's movie. And everyone's been judging her the whole time. And she has a real argument to why she's comfortable being the kind of person she is. And that that, because Triple A is the person that Molly felt like she had the best sense of and was judging mm -hmm. the most, that rug being pulled out from under her is kind of the icing on the cake as like, yeah, my whole worldview has been Yeah, my students re really responded to AAA's line, like I expected the guys to make all the sex jokes and slut shaming, but I never expected the fellow women. Yeah. And that really struck a nerve. That was one of our favorite lines. And then that Molly says, Amy didn't call you that. Like it's another realization right. that, that she maybe should have been learning from Amy and following Amy's lead right. more than she has been. Now, writers often draw on personal experience to place into their writing. So, Katie, is there anything you want to tell us about the inspiration for Amy getting arrested and then make up scene <laughs> with Molly through prison glass? What if here was where I did it? I was like, sorry, Mom. Um, you know, we wanted, we knew, as you were saying, the movie had to get bigger and bigger. And so we wanted Amy, the person who has been the most frightened and the most kind of fearful of things going wrong and, and the most comfortable staying at home and not doing anything, that she was going to be the one who was going to be the public face of this going wrong. And, and the worst thing that they thought could happen, which is we'll get arrested the night before graduation, happens to her. We wanted to let her kind of finish her arc on that moment of like, I'm willing to put myself out there in probably too big a way mm -hmm. and then and something she never would have done at the start of this day. I, I actually, one of my favorite scenes was Jared reading the uh, Molly's yeah. Feminist <laughs> Manifesto. Did that strike a chord with the audience? Is yeah. That right? yeah. <laughs> Did you know that would, that would land so well? Or? We, I, we hoped it would, I think, <laughs> because it was, because also Skyler's so funny, we knew he would kill it as he was presenting it, but just anyone having to read Molly's words as themselves, probably it would feel a little false in Jared the most. But, and he did such a good job, but it, anytime that you can, like that's kind of a scene where one half of it is killing time while the other half of it is racing to it. Yeah. So whatever's killing time needs to be really funny again, or else you just want to cut it and you can't cause you need to go back and forth. So we knew that we would need something that was worthy of staying. Now the ending was surprised me a little because it usually, you know, it's a very dramatic, usually fight, but you actually made it very subtle. They were burying their emotions down. Uh, was that really kind of funny? You wanted to take it a different approach to your ending because you had them really not talking about anything. In the and car at the airport. At the airport, yeah. yeah. That was another thing that, one of the first things that Olivia and I talked about is that when you really love someone, like you never say their name, you never look at them. Like there's so many movies that depict best friends yeah. and they're always like, but but Jonathan, it's like, I've never said my best friend's name out loud. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's either a nickname or no reference at all. And so this is such a massive moment for them. I mean, they've seen each other every day for the last decade and they're not going to see each other for this long and they're not going to be able to talk to each other that when you love someone that much and it's so painful to consider that you really can't acknowledge it. You have to, you, they, they don't have the words to say what that goodbye would be. So they essentially just have to 
pretend it's not a big deal until Amy comes back and then they're finally, there's like a, a release where they can acknowledge how much they're feeling. Was that all, did you have any inversions of it or was that no, really No, it was there? always that. It was nice to work backwards from mm. a moment that Olivia knew was the right ending for it because then everything, we knew that that was the place that it was coming to so we could kind of work retroactively. Okay, so we, I know you're doing a new movie with Olivia, don't worry, darling, we, we know we can't talk about it, so if you <laughs> ask, but what is the experience like working with Olivia? How does that partnership you know, transcend? You work from Booksmart now to here, how does that carry over? What is so special about your working relationship? I mean, I just feel so lucky. There's like that Mike Nichols quote where the question is like, how, how do you have a lasting marriage? And he says, marry Diane Sawyer. And that's kind of <laughs> how I feel about Olivia, which is like, the, that's the way to bet, make a great mm -hmm. movie, I think. She's so... Um, I think in general, like writer-director relationships work best when the director is a really wonderful storyteller themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think Olivia is a brilliant storyteller. And I think she's also incredibly collaborative in all the right ways. Like when we were first working together, I realized like she knows all the answers she has to have as the creative leader of this story. And she also is fine asking questions for so many other things. Sometimes you see a leader who doesn't want to ask any questions or allow anybody else's ideas in because they think it somehow takes away from their own vision. And she knows exactly what the story is so well that she welcomes the people who also mm -hmm. know that story in to be a part of that collaboration. And I think she allows the people that work with her to be their bravest selves because you know that she knows what it is. So if it's, if it's off the mark, she'll help you <laughs> by not, by making it fit whatever it is or find something else. And so I think, you know, it's, a, it's wonderful in general, kind of in this kind of dynamic to work with one of your best friends because it requires so much trust and it requires so much groupthink, <laughs> and it requires like a, a, a lot of time, obviously, which is a big part of it. But I just, I think, I feel very lucky to be able to keep working with her because I think she's just the most talented director there is. And I'm really excited for people to see don't worry, darling, because I think that will just cement that. Okay, we have time for a few audience questions. So Catherine is going to raise your hand. She'll call on you and bring you in a mic. Please just keep your question short and one question at a time because we want to get as many in as possible. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say the movie's great. I remember watching it in cinema with my mom back at home, and we loved it. Like, it was such a great movie. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, what is the process of creating a story because there's so much going on in the movie and it's obviously so important that everything has a purpose and it stays relevant like what is it like what's the creative process like of making a movie of such caliber like there's so much going on it's, yeah thank you so much first of all I think it ends up being kind of like parallel tracks for me where it has to be based on like a character and what they're going through, because otherwise it all will feel like nonsense. So you come up with a character that you love and you know where you want them to start and where you want them to end. And then I think you also, and so that that maybe inherently gives you ideas of what needs to happen on the way, even just emotionally, where it's like if she starts out judging everyone and by the end she realizes she shouldn't, what are the three or four big moments that shift the first thing where she realizes she might have judged too much, the second, the third, and then you get there. And then I think for me, if it's a world that I am excited about, I'll just come up with a bunch of things I think would be fun to happen in that story, like a murder mystery party or a, or a, a lift ride that it turns out to be your teacher, something like that. And then when you have kind of like a blue sky version of all the things that could be fun and a, a skeleton version of what you know you want to happen to someone, you can try and hang those things on and see what, what ends up being both. So you're like, okay, great. If she needs to have a second example of someone not being themselves, maybe that's the lift scene. And you put that in the car with the driver and then it, they both inform each other. And then you have a, a, a more detailed skeleton of what the story will be. And then you realize, okay, well, they need to take that car somewhere. So where are they going? I think something like this too, you know, it's like, okay, this is essentially the Wizard of Oz in some way. So it's like, they're gonna go to three parties. Like that was a big part of my original pitch is like, we know they're gonna start it at school and they're gonna end at this big party that somebody's gonna throw. And I think it needs to be like Goldilocks and they need to go to three different parties to see three different social groups at school where they're getting the same experience, where they're realizing that these people that they judged are different based on the kind of graduation party that they were throwing. And then, so for me, it's kind of like, if, you're, if you can think of those two things concurrently and you find out where they meld, then that becomes something that you work on over and over and over. <laughs>
Hi there. So I also love the movie. This is my first time seeing it. Oh, cool. And um, as someone who graduated in the class of 2019, I saw a lot of similarities. I had a teacher who drove Lyft and talked about driving students in it's my your biography. class. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so obviously there was a lot of um, experiences that I recognized from my own, from being from that specific year. But there were cool things that like were obviously taken to a heightened level, like the amount of chaos going on in the hallway. So how did you figure out? how far to heighten it without going too far into unbelievability or making it too mundane. Yeah, I think part of it is coming from having kind of like a North Star tonally of what you're going for. And, and then I think you, end, you do end up accidentally going outside the lines of probably more often like too insane as opposed to too mundane with this movie. And then I think at the script stage, you can kind of feel like, okay, that's broader or that's wackier than everything else that feels like an outlier. And part of that is from having people you respect read it, and, and they'll probably mention that to you, and then also you reading it over and over, I think. I, again, was lucky in this one because I knew that Olivia had such a sense of what the tone was, that if there was something that veered, it would be corrected. But also, like, stuff like the chaos at the end. Like, that was, emotionally, you want everyone else to be having the greatest moment of their lives, while Molly's having the worst moment of her life so far. And so we wanted that to be huge. We wanted that to be broad. And we wanted to take advantage of the fact that like Nico Haraga, who played, who played Tanner, is an incredible skateboarder and could skateboard down the hallway while holding a fire extinguisher. And we wanted to take advantage of the slow-mo water balloons, which we were excited about. So again, it was kind of an opportunity where it was like all these things that we thought were cool worked really well in this moment we knew needed to be like, for everyone else, it's the celebration of a lifetime. And for Molly, it's her living nightmare. Um, I just wanted to know what the decision was behind casting uh, Beanie Feldstein. Was it because of Lady Bird? I, when I came on to the project, Olivia already wanted Beanie to be in that role. Like that was when she showed me her deck. It was Caitlin and Beanie. And so I think a big part of it was Lady Bird. I'm sure it was also the other things she'd done like Neighbors 2 and, and Hello Dolly. Like at the time, she was so exciting in that she was very funny. She clearly had amazing timing and she was incredibly warm and empathetic. And we knew that Molly as a character was gonna be so tough and so mean occasionally that someone like Beanie has so, so much heart and so much warmth inherently that you can get away with so much more of that. And also she was just seemed like the funniest person in the world at the time. And so we felt so lucky to, to be able to work with her. Okay, um, well, we always ask the same question of our guests as our last question. Uh, we are an academic institution, so we'd like to be professor for a moment. So <laughs> what is one film or screenplay you would like to assign our students, students to study? I would say, because I think it will be fun, and I think homework should be fun, <laughs> The Big Lebowski, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I think it's really fun to watch The Big Lebowski and imagine that that was a spec script that a studio was responding to. Because nothing in that movie, like if you imagine the studio notes that they would give to that movie, it just never would be made. Like it's, <laughs> it's making the, the, the most amazing, boldest choices always. And it's doing kind of, I think, what Olivia was talking about, which is like, it could only be a movie. And it's so funny and it, and it is so brave and courageous, I think, in the things that it's trying to do and what it's showing on screen. And it just goes, it throws every noodle at the wall and it works. And I can see myself as a writer writing something like that and then getting self-conscious, like that doesn't make any sense or like that doesn't need to be there or that, that's maybe too crazy for this. And I, every time I watch that movie, I'm so amazed by how much confidence they had in what they were making to leave what they left in and to do what they did. And every minute of it to me is brilliant. So that would be my assignment. Uh, well, as I mentioned in the opening, this is our last script of screen of the year, the academic year. Like the graduating book smart characters of Amy and Molly, my student staff is leaving. <laughs> uh, Mason Campbell's been our production manager today. Catherine Kami called on people. Audrey Sharif and Ayla Ay 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 Pulching are upstairs directing and Gina Axton couldn't make it today but they're all moving on. I want to thank you for everything you've done, especially this last two years, the last year especially. We try to put theaters back together after COVID, and I couldn't have done it without you five. 
I want to thank you for all the work you did on the script to screen Q&As, not make me look like a jackass. <laughs> Uh, all the time, helping research, writing. You guys really, you co-producers, co-writers, it's been an amazing team. Uh, really, I just wanna, I wish I could call Malala and hold you guys back, <laughs> but I'm not going to. I'm just grateful for everything you've done. I know you'll have amazing lives. So thank you and we will miss you. And, and Katie, thank you for wonderful insights into making book smarts. Thank you so and, much for having me. You know, making this our, our their, student, their last script of screen memorable. And this is a really it. amazing program that you guys all put on and I'm really honored to be a part of it and I'm excited to see what you do doing going forward. Well, you're welcome back to be any part of that anytime. <laughs> so we'd love to have you back. Thank you. Thank you.